quarantined in Texas, introducing the best of Texas and a deep dive into Texas high school water polo history with Coach Mack. Here we go. It's the TX Water Polo Podcast. I'm James Smith following stay-at-home orders in Austin, and Joe Lanahan is in that room with the ceiling fan and the memorabilia in North Texas. Right, Joe? I am yes, I am in my home office in North Texas. I got a new webcam, so Joe and I were ch- chatting yesterday. <laughs> Talk about faces for radio, man! Like <laughs> this is it, it, we are we are never doing a video podcast ever. Do you understand? Definitely, me? definitely hair for radio for sure. So <laughs> there you go. Hey, have you gone shopping yet? Like, what has you? I, I did it for the first time yesterday, and I, I we never even talked about it. It's gone like what grocery store shopping? Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 And we no, wear no. our latex gloves. I'm we are we have not done the mask yet, but we probably will start doing that here soon. Yeah, so. I didn't either. I was one of the only ones in Sprouts in uh, Round Rock who did not have a mask on it. But I I have a whole bunch of like, you know, wipes and stuff. So anyway, so far I feel fine. But I well, was just wondering about that. I hope I hope you keep feeling fine. I hope everybody out there listening is doing well as well, because we just wish everybody the best as we get through all this together. So yeah, this is pretty brutal. So uh, that, but this is your respite. You get to listen to us yammer on about Texas water polo. So um, aside from shopping, has anything been going on with your club that's changed? No, just kind of. I just keep sending them emails. Um, and and workouts and links to videos and we're going to be doing some we're going to start some dryland stuff uh next week with everybody uh, uh just a shout out to ally hill for kind of giving me that yeah that idea um we're also going to start probably next week doing some online uh chalk talks and such too so how are you doing the um dryland stuff or who's gonna you know you have a program in place and you have somebody to lead that it's going to be it's going to be on zoom and then okay. it's everybody will be able to see it i'll like i'll put it up on my screen and then everybody can see that it's going to list everything with a big timer i'm going to i'm going to throw some music on there as well it'll it'll start off simple um and kind of easy for the like but the main thing is just an opportunity for all the kids to kind of get together and uh just kind of catch up and say hi so are you sure your mu- music choices are going to be the ones that these athletes want to hear Actually, I'm going to be trying to get some of my assistant coaches to kind of pick it's the music. a very good right idea. Now. Excellent so, idea. The yeah. answer to your question is no. But okay. <laughs> We're doing the same thing. Actually, one of my parents is a, is a pretty knee-deep in fitness and has a degree in it. And so we're talking about having her um, manage this process because – I don't want to do it. I just want to meet these knuckleheads every Wednesday. We'll t- go over some game film. But other than that, the, the, and and I'm sh- I'm calling them out these Aquatex kids because we had our conference last Wednesday and uh, you know get to see everyone's beautiful face. And my first question is, have you guys been doing the workouts? And you see eyes darting up and down and on the side and <laughs> these funny grins. Like no, no one's doing the workout. So anyway, we're gonna try to be a little more accountable about that. Well, I think everybody's doing a little bit more and more at, like as we go on and everybody gets acclimated to doing online school and everybody kind of gets into a in a bit of a of a rhythm. So. Yeah. Speaking of school. So the UIL, in fact, I'm going to read some of it, um, just sort of catching up on what's going on in Texas. They amended their suspension of activities. I, You and I share our affection for the UIL website. It's so great. Uh, UIL League is further modifying contingency plans and extending its previously announced timeline for completing UIL activities this academic school year. These modifications are based on schools resuming operations on Monday, May 4. And so what that means basically is, again, I think we've mentioned this before, um, if the UIL decides to have some sort of spring championships, water polo is going to do their darndest to have a spring yeah. championship as well. If yeah. the UIL decides to cancel all their spring sports, water polo is going to be canceled at the high school level as well. That's right. essentially what's going to be kind of happening moving forward. Yeah. And I mean, no one here is rooting for that not to happen. It's just that it feels fairly certain that it won't, but that's well, maybe I'm see. pessimistic. Yeah, exactly. We will see. We're all, yeah, we're all just kind of waiting and seeing, but I mean, we do have a little bit of update. Um, the tags water polo state champs, which is the eighth grade and sixth grade and mm-hmm. under state champs, which was scheduled for May 9th and 10th. It was supposed to be at Keller, um, an, uh, an auditorium in North Texas that has been postponed. It hasn't been canceled. It's been postponed. Um, and what does that mean? Once we know about high school season and JOs, 
then we're either going to find a place in the summer or a place in the fall to have that tournament. That's oh, our I goal to have that tournament somewhere. I didn't realize it could be pushed back into the fall, which is totally fine. It's just not something I thought of. So cool. I mean, everything's on the table right now. There's, yeah, yeah. you know, you got to okay. think outside the box a little bit. And totally. then some people have asked me about the Welcome to Texas shootout. Um, it's still technically scheduled. We are we are looking at other options out there, either kind of moving it back into the summer or yeah, or maybe even kind of moving it to Labor Day weekend. Um, but there are options out there. And as soon as we hear some like like an update, we will let everyone know. Okay, cool. Um and, and junior calls. Olympics too, right? I mean, yeah. And then everybody's been asking about quals. We don't know exactly about quals. It's uh, it, yeah, the NGO quals. It's going to be really yeah dependent on if there is going to be a national junior Olympics. Um, and right now this it is still scheduled to happen. Um, so our quals are still scheduled. They're still on the Southwest Zone calendar. Um, but if we get to that point, then everybody. Once the word comes down that we are having it and we are moving forward with JOs, everybody's then going to have to kind of replan for JOs again and kind of and, uh, and just double and triple check the amount of kids and the amount of teams. Then we have to go back and see if do we need to actually have a calls or if or if kind of we just do seating depending on the time frame. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of what ifs. So um, and we're hoping to hear uh, kind of kind of one way or the other as far as kind of yeah as far as JOs here by the end of April. And then again, once we know that, we will let everyone know. And as of right now, any changes as far as the USA water polo events um, and, and also the major kind of the high school events are going to be, it can be found at the Southwest Zone calendar. What is it? Southwestwaterpolo.org. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what happens as far as you know, if JO does not take place, what do you think? I mean, I think that's going to be uh, like an opportunity for all the people that are currently hosts. It's going to be an opportunity for the Southwest Zone Board and Events Committee to get together and kind of just create a schedule if if we can actually get back in pools. Right. Right. So um, and if that's the case, then, you know, there might be some zone championships in August there. You know, we're like, you know, we're like we might move tags till the middle of July. Um, it's going to allow us to have a bit of flexibility to have a kind of a. Uh, maybe one big summer slash fall season. So, because I think everybody, once this kind of lifts a little bit, everybody's going to want to get out and about and do some different things. Yeah. And a lot of kids are are going to want to play water polo. So, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about theoretically doing, if the high school season is canceled this spring, then doing something in the summer or the fall. It would be unofficial, obviously. It would be a USA water polo thing, but get these kids to at least play each other in some sort of tournament. I think that would be really fun. I think there's a lot of things that are going to be on the table. It's just, you know, the not the problem. It's just the challenge is going to be a lot of clubs are playing at school district run facilities. And if yes. the schools close, yep. what's going to ha- are those facilities going to close? We don't know. Right. Um and that's and that's going to be the big big question out there because we don't want to have a state championship, you know, without everybody at least having the choice to go participate. Right. Yeah. 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 Kind of in it. That's going to be the tough part. It is all tough boy. And now, and what do you tell everyone about the best of Texas? All right. So it's a good segue. Um, given that we have so much more time and we're probably going to do this anyway, because I was always interested in, although I, the, this idea came about because other people are doing similar things, but um, I, this is my interest. So uh, the best in Texas, we're going to talk with people who know and come up with a list of the, the five best girls and boys high school teams for every decade, beginning with the seventies. Joe's already started conversations in this regard. Um, and we're going to ask you for your input, um, and how that takes place. We're still going to work that out, but this Thursday we'll begin rolling out that subject and then we'll discuss it at least once a week. I mean, if we're going to do it every Thursday, then it could be twice a week that we'll, we'll break this stuff out, but we'll do, we'll do these in order. So the first is we'll come up with these teams that are the best of each decade, boys and girls, and these are high school teams. Then this is exciting. We're going to create two 16-team brackets, each with the 16 best boys and girls high school teams of all time. Uh, And then you will get to vote on each round, just like it's a Final Four selection, although there's no gambling. But uh, that'll come after we've come – after we discuss the teams of the decade that I just described. And then finally – and who knows how long this is going to take, man. This could go into 2021. But – 
Joe and I will declare definitively which programs were the best, the best in every decade, and no one gets any say in it. It's just our choices, no debate whatsoever. It's the txwaterpolo.com choices for play, uh, for programs of the decade. Don't you like that? It's going to be fun. And again, uh, so we're going to have a special podcast this uh, later this week. That's going to explain how it's going to be done and, and the calendar. I hope it doesn't go to, to 2021. You I think don't. it's going to be at the end of April, early May. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, but it, yeah, it's yeah, it's going to be a, a lot of fun. It's, it's been a lot of fun kind of talking to, to a lot of different people out there as far as like, you know, the 70s and 80s and 90s teams and kind of just going down uh, uh, memory lane a little bit. So, yeah, what it's, I'm actually quite serious about that. There's so obviously I'm a newcomer to the state. I've been here for about 10 years on and off. Um, and so I'm continually learning about what's happened historically in the state. And I think as the sport has grown here and has become much more prominent, I get the sense that the you know younger players don't really know what has come before them. And that's I'm, that's to be expected. But now, just based on what I see on social media and elsewhere, there's a people are dying for this kind of stuff. They want to know you know the, the history. And so this is our opportunity we, to really cover Texas. And when it started off, we have an interview to on this podcast with Mac McDonald about the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Then on Thursday, you know, we're going to have the second part of that interview about the 2000s and 2010s again with Mac. Tell so, people who don't know who Mac is just Mac in 13 is, seconds what, what his Mac is. Mac is currently the head coach at Lamar High School, but he has been around since the 70s, 80s, and 90s. He has been one of the biggest figures in high school water polo in Texas, you know, throughout the decades. And he was a huge, huge part of the whole UIL hat, uh, uh, fall 21 thing happening. He's so. been there from the start basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Well, Joe, it's time for a break. Right about now, you might be expecting some song and dance about a product you don't need. Well, shush, we don't advertise here. And we want to keep it that way. So we sure would appreciate your help. Show your support by going to txwaterpolo.com forward slash donate so we can keep covering the sport we love in the great state of Texas. Hi, this is Natalie Benson, and you are listening to a podcast about water polo in Texas. back and it is time for the segment that is just it's just crushing it I, I think there's discussions about this segment all around the country it's time to ask joe what's going on so um things obviously as you've uh, heard in our last segment are, are still continuing on the calendar but you also have a bunch of items that you wanted to to share what are these no just we're going to be starting the southwest zone coaches to coaches uh zoom meetings we're going to start that this upcoming Thursday, April 9th. So a lot of you are kind of are going to be listening to this on Wednesday, April 8th. So on Thursday, April 9th at 1230 p.m. Texas time, we're going to start and it's going to be every Tuesday, Thursday, starting this upcoming Thursday. And I'm going to get some uh, uh, local coaches from around Texas to kind of share their knowledge about us, about one specific aspect of water polo. And they're going to have like a little 10, a 10, 15 minute uh, kind of chalk talk. And we're just going to go through a bunch of different coaches. And this upcoming Thursday, it's going to be Allie Hill from Longhorn Aquatics. Ooh. And going to talk about how she's doing the dryland sessions kind of kind of with her team. Um, and then also, so we're going to have a, a double bill. It's going to also be Chris Cullen, who's who's going to talk about some about kind of how he teaches the center position. So that's going to be this upcoming Thursday. Starting next week, it's going to be Tuesday and Thursday. And then we're just going to have a single speaker on each one. Um, so, and it's going to be a lot of different coaches from around the state and it's going to be a, a lot of fun. It's just an, also an opportunity for people to kind of, kind of tune in and listen, but everybody, all the coaches and club admins are going to get an email about that and kind of, that'll be sent out, uh, like kind of prior kind of to the meeting with the zoom, it's going to be via zoom. We're also going to start on, uh, next week on Wednesday, April 15th, it's going to be Southwest zone town hall meeting. It's going to be just it's going to be me kind of talking. It's going to be more of a kind of a webinar type of format as opposed to a Zoom meeting. And it's going to be more about me kind of talking with um, about, 
you know, kind of one week it might be kind of playing in college. The next week it might be the history of water polo in Texas. The next week it, yeah, it might be, you know, some terminology, some like some parent education. And then we're just going to do some different kind of topics each week. And I'll probably have some special guests each week as well on that. Um, that'll again start April 15th and everybody will get an email about that. That'll be all athletes and parents and coaches are going to get emails about that. Um, and then I think we're going to be up like the, like the TX water polo website has been updated with some new education links. Cause there's a ton of new stuff out there on the web with this whole kind of shutdown going on. Um, and yeah. And then I think, uh, also kind of, you've put some new stories up there as well too, right, James? Yeah. You're going to have to, it may be updated. You get, you have a lot of work tonight to do tonight, Joe, to get that it's education okay. stuff updated. It'll yeah. happen. It'll happen. Look, it'll be out there. Everybody knows that, right? So, um, yeah, total water polo. Uh, man, this um this downtime is obviously something that none of us want, but it has given us the opportunity to go out and find some very interesting things that are water polo related. So, first of all. If you haven't already, go back and listen to the interview that I did with Peter Hudnut. Um, he did a camp in uh, Houston. December. November, was it? or just, It was December, it was, yeah. It was December up at the Woodlands. Yeah, so I had a conversation with him over what sounds like you know cans and wires. It was terrible, but still did our best to edit that thing so that it was, it was presentable. And he's a really interesting guy, and he has a bigger connection with Texas than I ever thought. So um, go back and find that podcast uh, where where I speak with him. Um, we're also, we, I'm continuing to expand content on Total Water Polo. You can find a whole bunch of new educational materials similar to the ones that Joe described. These are done by... Um, two coaches in particular, Jack Coker, who's a very successful coach out at Oaks Christian High School in, in, uh, in around Thousand Oaks, and uh, Coach Brian Flax. That guy, that guy's going places, don't you think? He's, I think he's, he's already a, there. Yeah, he's I mean, he, he's a he coaches at Harvard Westlake, which is a you could basically call a dynasty. But man, oh man, he's going to be in demand once one of these big college jobs open. But anyway, go back and uh, and check all that stuff out. And then uh, the, the schedule for their uh, Zoom meetings is also on Total Water Polo. And, and then, then and then also yeah. for um yeah for those that are listening that are looking to for uh, coaching positions here in Texas, either in Texas or or kind of moving from out of Texas back to Texas, um go to go to TexasSwimming.org or to um uh, uh the Tisca Water or the Tisca Swimming website. And there's lots of good options. There's a ton of uh, kind of high school swimming slash water polo positions. And a lot of the new positions are actually mentioning water polo okay, good. because that, that's coming up in fall of uh, 2021. And for those that don't know, it's not just going to be a part time job, a uh, stipend type job in order to coach any sport in in. Uh, in Texas under the UIL, you need to be a full time employee of that school district. So, right. I'm I'm. My uh, high school career is over. That's what you're saying. Uh, actually, I think that there's plenty of people who are fairly happy to know that. But yeah, the, this is made for people who are working on what we would call on campus. Yeah, you can always referee, James. So I could. That's true. It's another another discussion to have. Um, uh, Joe, we got an email like uh, from, uh, and I'm just going to say it's from Kristen. She's one of our fans, and she said this. It would be fun if you guys shared your favorite water polo memory as a player and included a picture from sometime during your age group or college days on the website. So um, starting with the two of us. And I've been giving this thought. Do you want to go first, or I have my, I, I've, I have two memories? I'll let you go first. You know, let me go first. All right. So first of all, I have a th- there's a really good picture of me on Total Water Polo. It's I can't remember who the photographer was. It was one of our parents back in the day was a good photographer and did these black and white photos. Really cool. It makes it look like I really knew what I was doing. I was gapping two Newport Harbor players in 84 back when I was looked good. Um, My I have two memories as a player. One was um, my junior year. Wilson were playing Newport Harbor at Belmont Plaza. The place is rocking. It was back in the day when, you know, sent we were just more. We were called whole set, by the way. Damn. We were more ball distributors than scorers. You know, my coach, Rick Jones, um, who's pretty legendary, used to call us passing bridges. You know, so you're 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 doing 10 times as many passes as your shots. But there is one chance in that game where I turned a guy maybe I swear it's like 15 degrees was nothing. 
And then there's another crashing who's about ready to destroy me. And I couldn't keep my head above the water because I wasn't that good. But I flicked the ball in this sort of general area and uh, did did a total cliche movie thing where I'm underwater. I pop up and I'm thinking like I'm going to have to go counterattack. And the crowd's going bananas. And uh, and my teammates are going bananas, which was not e- that was not easy. <laughs> they they did not give credit all that much, but I scored. So we we were up on Newport Harbor at home, and I swear to God, I can't remember whether we won that game or not. I think we did, but anyway. And then, oh boy, second one. I worked the entire 1984 Olympics. Did you know that, Joe? I did not. I was a ball boy. It was me and five of my other knucklehead teammates from Wilson. Um, our middle school English teacher was Be- uh, Becky Shaw, Tim Shaw's mom. Mm-hmm. So she got us this gig. Anyway, we did. So we were the ball boys there. And um, what was cool, and it was at Pepperdine, gorgeous pool. And ABC TV was the broadcaster for the entire Olympics uh, at, in the day. And they needed to do blocking shots and all kinds of uh, simulation for a game. So they just said, hey, can you guys jump in and play? So it ended up being... Um, Long Beach Wilson versus like this team of other all-stars. Cause obviously there's all these volunteers who are water polo players, including, uh, Ricardo Azevedo. He was, he was on the other team and it was so much fun because, you know, you could go look over at the screen and they're putting up the Chiron and all this stuff about, you know, I, I could have been, you know, Jody Campbell, number three or whatever. And, um, plus we won and I scored twice. So it was pretty cool. But to this day, I wonder if there's some random videotape in ABC's vault with uh, with that scrimmage. And if there were, I would pay for that because that was just such a good memory. You know, that's actually some pretty good memories. A lot of my memories are not as G-rated as that. <laughs> um, oh, no, there's plenty of those, too. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of stuff that probably can't fly nowadays. Um, but uh, I so I have a, I have a couple of kind of kind of really good memories as a player. One is, you know, I remember playing at the St. Louis AAU Junior Olympics back in the mid 80s. Um, And that was a lot of fun. Uh, That was my first kind of Junior Olympics as a player. And that was just just yeah. And yeah. And that was just great to be on the trip. We actually drove from San Antonio to St. Louis. So I still I still remember kind of listening to to, the cars uh, cassette tape on the way up there kind of constantly. So I know who the cars are. And um but like it was just a great atmosphere and going to see all like all like all the other sports and teams. So we had a 12 and under team. We also had an older kids team. I'm I'm sure the older kids had a lot more kind of the R-rated stories kind of back then. Um, some other good stories that I remember. I remember a, a few years later being at the Junior Olympics and uh, and playing for I think I guess I'm, I was probably a 13 14 year old and playing for an older kids team. And I still and I still remember this is not a good memory, by the way, <laughs> we we uh, we were in the semifinals and we had just tied the game with about two seconds left. And um, and all we had to do was go with the overtime and then yeah, and yeah, and then we could maybe beat them and go to uh, and make it uh, and make it to the finals. Well, the other team, they threw the ball back and somebody did a full court shot. Our goalie went up to try to catch it. And it went right through their hands and scored. Mm. So I've always told my coaches ever since, or all, like, all, I've always told my goalies ever since then, make sure you pull the ball down. Don't try to catch it. Yeah. Um, and then kind of a college kind of a memory. I still remember, you know, we we had gotten the like the collegiate water polo kind of associate. I played at A&M for a collegiate club. And I still remember being um, we had their first like kind of Southwest Division championship um, at A&M and we hosted it and we and we had to play. I don't know who we had to play, probably Texas. And we had to play them. And it was like the winner gets to go to, to the national championship and then the loser stayed home. And I still remember just being in a zone that game. And I think I have had kind of one of the best games of my life. I think we, I think I ended up scoring kind of the six or seven goals. I, I had a couple of assists and I still remember after we won the game by a couple of goals, I just laid back and floated in, in, in the water and I looked up and the stands were packed. Yeah, that's a And I had feeling. no clue that the stands were that packed. That's yeah, so cool. Yeah. No clue. Um, but then 
and hopefully somebody can ask us the question about our, our about our favorite coaching memory because that's what's kind of on my mind right now too is I have a ton of coaching memories that kind of, yeah just kind of out there just kind of dealing with kids because that's because that's what's it's it's really about nowadays. Let's let's hold off on that because that's a good point. But uh, I like that thing where because a lot of us that are sort of older and coaches are involved in the game, you sort of forget that we did actually play at one point. Um, and so yeah, it's kind of fun to go over this stuff. And we'll I, I think we're gonna ask other coaches these same questions i i think i have a uh, an interview lined up for this coming week and and uh, i will ask him or her i'm gonna leave it uh, vague uh, about these same kind of things like what are your favorite memories as a player so very very cool and thank you to Kristen for the question and keep them coming so uh and somebody else wrote to say that uh, the the only place that we had advertised that there's email is on this podcast but there is a contact page on the site but whether you use it or not, it's fine with me. You can just uh, email us at pod at txwaterpolo.com. So um, let's uh, let's get out of here, and we'll listen to your conversation, Joe, with the legendary Mac McDonald next. Hey, this is Mark Lawrence from Austin College, head coach of the men's and women's water polo programs and home of our kangaroos. When I'm interested in uh, what's going on with Texas water polo, I always listen to the TX water polo podcast. I am today, I'm with Mac McDonald, who is currently the head coach at Lamar High School. And Mac, you've been a lot of different places. How are you doing here during this whole kind of the COVID-19 stuff going on? I'm, I'm doing fine. Um, I did a, what they call a retire rehire about four, maybe five years ago, uh, to where I'm supposedly only working half a day. Well, when they took all of the uh, students and put them online and took all of the teachers and told them that they would be teaching online, came to the realization that whatever it is that I do for half a day can't be done online. So I really don't have a whole lot to do. And if this is retirement, I don't like it. I'm not looking forward to retirement either. And I think that you have been, I don't know if you're ever going to fully retire, Mac. I don't know if you're ever going to fully retire. I know that you've been around and you've had a few birthdays yourself and you're yeah. and and everybody knows that you're the like kind of currently the head coach at Lamar High School and tell us a little bit. So where did Matt come from? I grew up in Pasadena, went to Rayburn High School when I was a uh, when I was about eight or nine years old. I swam for what was then called the AAU uh, swimming team in Pasadena called Kitty Morris. From there, I went to. Uh, Bay Shore, so I swam a little bit as an age grouper, uh, but when I got to high school, like every other boy in Texas, I was trying to play football, tore up a knee, and coach that I can still remember his name, Coach Odell Harrison, changed the direction of my life. He, uh, he called me in during my one of my rehabs and said, you know, Mac, short, small, short, small, fast, white kid, we got a spot for you out here, but short, small, slow white kid, you might want to give that swimming thing a try again. So he, uh, <laughs> he, he moved me in that direction. Uh, it, it's been what I've done ever since. Uh, my father used to tell me you can't make a living around a swimming pool, but uh, obviously you can. It's, it's not a rich living, but it's got a lot of richness to it. So I've been uh, involved with swimming ever since high school. So we're very thankful to pole. all the like uh, yeah, to the Rayburn um, High School football coach for um, allowing yeah. you to to kind of kind of show you the way. Well, the Rayburn freshman B team coach. Actually, hey, uh, it's, hey, hey, it's still football, so there you go. Right, so. it is complete with injury. Uh, but yeah, that that changed my high school career. I swam through high school. We thought we played water polo when I was at Rayburn. Coach Anzelka would get in, and we'd try to throw a ball through a lifeguard stand and just about anything goes. Uh, so we thought we were playing water polo, but we didn't have actual water polo going on. Um, then when I got to college, I went to Rice University and I was swimming. A gentleman named Ray Thiel was a graduate assistant or something there. And he had played water polo in Germany. So he tried to get a club team going, invited the swimmers out. We, uh, we came out there and said, okay, tell us how you play this thing. And he said, it's kind of like basketball. So we got in the water and the first time I picked my, picked the ball up, a uh, foreign, foreign student named uh, Nick, Nick from Holland, 
climbed all over me, danced on my <laughs> head, stole the ball, swam off. When I came up spitting, I go, hey, I thought you said it was like basketball. And Ray Teal said, yeah, but there's a rule I needed to tell you. If you're holding the ball, pretty much anything goes. I go, oh, fine. Well, tell me a few more of these rules that aren't in existence, and let's play some more. It's starting to sound like fun. So that's where I started playing was at Rice. Uh, it was uh, Texas A&M was the dominant team. They were a legitimate uh, college varsity program. The rest of us were very illegitimate club teams. And if you had any connection whatsoever with that school, you were eligible. So there were very few of us that were actually undergrads at Rice, uh, but we had several graduate students that would come in. We had some medical students at the med center that had played elsewhere. Uh, they came with us and we played. And it actually built up to a point that Dennis Fosdick called something the Southwest Conference uh, Championships. Uh, and there were teams from eight of the nine Southwest Conference schools that played uh, my junior and senior year, 74 and 75. So that was my college experience. When I graduated from Rice, uh, had a had a number of people that I had told I was going to be an attorney. I was supposed to go to law school, but a professor there at Rice told me that he had a position if I wanted to get my teaching credential. They didn't have student teaching at Rice, but they had an internship. So I went to Jersey Village to fulfill that. And the plan was I was going to coach for just a few years and then I was supposed to go to the law school. Well, 44 years later, I've never gone to law school, but I think I made the right choice. So, uh, I, th I think, I think you did too. I didn't know that you started at Jersey Village. So. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first, first place that I coached. Uh, and we started it off as a club team between Jersey Village and Cy Fair. And then they made a split into actual high school teams in order to play in the state tournament. So we did that. And uh, that's uh, that, that program is still going both Jersey Village and Cy Fair is, and I think they've got about 11 or 12 schools out in that school district. It's amazing the growth out there. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I should say that I'm very grateful that, that that happened because Dr. Mark Henry, the superintendent for Cypher ISV was instrumental. In fact, he was probably our saving grace in getting water polo adopted by the UIL. He is my, my new favorite hero. And, uh, I, I'm very, very, indebted to the Cypher ISD. Yes. Uh, now, did Jersey Village start playing before Cy Creek? We started at the same time, but they made a split, and we had enough kids at Jersey Village to put, you know, we had 11 or 12 that we could put a legitimate high school team out there. Cypher didn't have enough playing, uh, so they played with us in club stuff, but when we went high school, they didn't get started until two, maybe three years after that. A uh, kid named Terry Adkins moved in from Wyoming, had played where he was before. He moved into Cy Fair, and then they started playing as well. Nice. And then after, after Jersey Village, you moved up to North Shore? Yeah. From Jersey Village, after I finished that one-year internship, I went to North Shore. I was there for eight years. I actually coached both North Shore and Galena Park High School at the same time. And uh, that, that's interesting, coaching – two different teams at the same time because your loyalties are constantly trying to be divided. And I did the best that I could to do the best for both schools. But when they would play each other, I didn't see how I could coach one and not the other. So I bowed out and let the captains coach that team. And I think that led to, uh, if, if we kept accurate records, would stand as the record for the most goals scored in a game because there was one year no I defense. singled them out. But one of those teams beat the other team 52 to 3 because the team that was the three had spent the week talking trash to the team that was the 52, and the captains didn't call them off. Uh, oh, that is one of those things where I don't know why they were talking trash if they ended up losing 52 to 3. Oh, uh, I guess if you're going down, you're going to go down swinging. There you go. Yeah. And then after North Shore, you, yeah, like, uh, like you moved over to Ross Sterling, which I think a no, lot of people don't know that they used Oklahoma. to be a powerhouse. So, yeah, I went from North Shore to Oklahoma, though. I left North oh, yeah, Shore that's right, that's right. to Oklahoma, uh, Enid, Oklahoma. Enid, Oklahoma is two and a half hours from anywhere and everywhere. It's always a bus ride. In fact, Enid was best described by a basketball coach named Don Haskins that coached the, uh, 
West Texas uh, basketball team. Yeah, Texas I, Western. They beat Texas Kentucky Western. in in, they, uh, they in the early 60s. To, uh, to, anyway, they set NCAA history. Anyway, Haskins described Enid as it's so flat you can sit on your front porch and watch your dog run away for two days. And that's uh, – that's about what Enid was like, but I thoroughly enjoyed my eight years there in Enid, Oklahoma. I had some of the fastest swimmers I've ever coached in my life. They had a really, really strong uh, USS team that I coached as well. Uh, we sent a couple of kids to Olympic trials. It was, uh, it was a great experience because it's a very small town. Everybody there went to Enid High School. They were all very, very aware of everything that happened there. So it made you kind of the ultimate big fish in the little pond kind of thing. Yeah. But after eight years there, my own children here in Texas were about to enter high school. I wanted to get back down here. I, uh, I called my buddy Tom Landgraf at Sterling High School. He had, I'd, I'd actually introduced him to the game of water polo when I was coaching at North Shore, and he came to, to Sterling. And he had become very, very uh, successful. So I called him and I said, look, I'm looking to come back to Texas. Do you know any jobs that are open? And he said, well, you can have mine because I'm going to California. So that was another, uh, it, it was a very, very fortunate thing to be able to walk into a program that was as established and as strong as Sterling was in 1992. But I'm not sure following a legend like Tom Landgraf is something that I would suggest to anybody because that's a, that's a difficult uh, set of shoes to fill. I don't, I don't, th I think you're selling yourself a little short, Mac. I think you did a great job at Sterling. I think you won multiple state championships there. Great swim teams. And yeah, and the set of, and kind of definitely set Scott Sully up for success after you left. So, well, Scott, Scott doesn't have any, any trouble following uh, people that are legends. He's, uh, he, he's done very well and I'm extremely proud of all of his success. I was glad that. He got the job at Sterling because I very much believed in Welcome Back Cotter. I felt like the best person to coach Sterling is someone that graduated from Sterling. And uh, Scott did. I was disappointed when he left, but I understand why he did so. He, uh, he saw chances to advance, and he's obviously advanced. Uh, Sterling was followed there by uh, T.J. Markowitz, who had played for Tom Landgraf again mm -hmm. at yeah. uh, Clear Lake. So there was some continuity there. Uh, and then Allie Hill came in to coach Sterling as well and, and did a fantastic job with those teams. So I, uh, I'm, I'm still very, very proud of the time at Sterling and what the Sterling program has been. Uh, a lot of people said that they would always associate me with Sterling. When I first went to Lamar, it was something that everybody still thought of me as the Lamar, as the Sterling coach. But I've now spent 14 years at Lamar so if you add all that up, it's 44 years, and I've been at Lamar and Sterling 14 years each. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to be remembered or uh, or what those memories are going to be. At well, each well, the story's not done yet, Mac. The story's not done yet. Not yet. Now, not and yet. then, and then, yeah. the primary reason that we're talking now is in this uh, in yeah uh, in this segment. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. So like, and give everybody like a, like just a general kind of like view of what water polo was like back in the day. You were around back in the seventies. I know you were kind of in college until about, about 74, 75, but right. you were around. Tell us about how it all got started back in the seventies. Uh, Dennis Fosdick came to Texas. Dennis came from, uh, came from California, of course, where he had his beginnings in water polo. He was coaching the Amarillo boys swimming club in Amarillo when he got the job at Texas A&M. And when he came to A&M, he started a water polo program. And A&M, as I said, was a legitimate uh, varsity water polo program. Mm -hmm. And in order to, uh, to have some walk-ons that could be able to come in and play, Dennis was very instrumental in developing boys water polo in the state of Texas. Uh, the first several tournaments were there at A&M. Uh, the first ones were won by A&M Consolidated because a couple of guys that went on to, to actually star at A&M when they went to college started off at A&M Consolidated High School and played for Steve Montgomery, who was my AAU coach when I was a kid. Uh, but Montgomery had the A&M Consolidated team, Bobby Leland and then Bill Leland, 
uh, led those teams to the first two state championships. They were, uh, they were very aware of how the game of water polo was supposed to be played and everyone else was learning on the fly. So they had a distinct advantage in order to, uh, to, to play those first two championships. Uh, they had a women's team there as well, uh, but the women had to play under a much different set of circumstances than what the uh, boys were playing because Foz would host something called the Novice Tournament where the boys would play the A&M freshman team. High school boys teams would play the A&M freshman team, but then he allowed for an actual boys high school state championship that was strictly high school age teams representing their schools. The girls, however, had to play against the A&M women, and they did that through the very early 70s. Uh, about, I don't know, I'm not sure, 76, 77, we, we decided that we wanted to have a true girls state championship. I'm thinking it was in 1970. Probably 77. Uh, 77. And we hosted at a, a combination of schools in the Clear Creek School District, Clear Creek High School, Clear Lake High School. Uh, we hosted a tournament for just high school girls, and that was the first only high school girls playing uh, state tournament. So, and clear, and, yeah, and it, it looks like the Clear Creek team was the dominant team back in the 70s. Creek was. Creek was even winning when they were having to play the A&M women's team. They had a couple of uh, – couple of really good players and a coach that had coached the sport before. Joe Carpenter had brought the sport to Clear Creek High School, had a couple of the first early dominant players. Trudy Glancy and her sister Anna Glancy uh, kind of carried that, uh, that Clear Creek team. They, they and Clear Lake were the dominant teams. Uh, and then when we had that tournament in 77, since it was no longer being hosted by A&M, we realized that we needed we needed a name, we needed an aegis, somebody to sponsor it. Uh, since all of the coaches involved were high school swimming coaches and we all belonged to Tiska, we just stuck the Tiska name on it and called the Tiska, called it the Tiska State Water Polo Championships. <laughs> and we started hosting our own state water polo championships at that point. This was unbeknownst to Tiska. I mean, of we course, didn't tell anybody we just did it. Uh, about that time, the National Federation decided that they were going to write a true high school rule book. Until then, we all played by NCAA rules and we were playing by the college rules. And so when the National Federation came out with a rule book, there was a, uh, we're gonna call it a debate amongst the Texas water polo coaches, Texas high school water polo coaches. And we debated very loud and very strong as to whether we wanted to play under the NCAA rules or these new high school rules. There wasn't much difference. Um, it was things that really didn't affect the way the game was played, but the number of timeouts and some things that we thought were necessary for high school. But we had this debate, and as our debates tend to do, it spilled onto the floor at the Tiska General Meeting, and we were debating high school rules versus college rules at the top of our somewhat inebriated voices and a bunch of the swimming coaches were looking at each other and asking, so we've got water polo? When did this happen? We go, oh, we've been playing for years. Um, that's how we became a TISCA sport. Then TISCA said, well, if y'all are going to exist, we've got to have some rules. They formed a committee. And TISCA has been running it through that time uh, and will up through what? We'll have a spring season in 2021. Correct. And then all of this comes to a fruition when the UIL – adopts water polo in the fall of 2021. So that's something that I have uh, thought about and dreamed about and worked with other coaches toward trying to make that happen. And it's a, a very satisfying feeling right now to know that that's going to come about. And for those that don't know, Mac was, has been kind of, yeah, has been chasing the dream for 20, 30 years at least as far as the whole UIL. And he was a primary piece to making it over the hump and getting across the, uh, across the finish line there for the fall of, of uh, 2021. But back to the seventies, some, yeah, like, you know, some other uh, very good teams. You had Lamarck where there was Don Boyd. They like, I think St. Mark's won in 1975, but then we kind of finished up the year with, we had with, with Clear Lake and, uh, and Laney Landrop uh, kind of winning boys and girls. 
Right. Yeah. Lanny, Lanny is known as the most successful high school swimming coach in the state of Texas. I think that title would probably go to Tom Landgraf at this point, but there was a time when Lanny Landtroop, who never swam when he was a, a student uh, in, in high school or college, Lanny was a basketball player. And basketball translates very well to water polo. So Lanny's got a water polo background, and Clear Lake was one of the dominant teams. Also, um, like uh, another swim coach that kind of made a mark in both swimming and water polo was George Block at, at Alma Heights. Um, they won both boys and girls on in 1979. And uh, that kind of ushered in the era of the San Antonio dominance in the, in the 80s. Yes. And uh, I'm not sure where George came from, but obviously he had a water polo background. I'm, I'm pretty sure he did his undergraduate at, at Notre Dame. Uh, yes, he did. Yes, cause, Is that right? Yeah, because I actually swam for George Block and played over in San Antonio when I was a kid. So. Okay, well, he, uh, he saw water polo as a means of uh, advancing the swimming programs. Uh, Alamo Heights was, for a while, Alamo Heights was the only team out of San Antonio that was playing. There was a time when it was the, uh, the Houston area, which went from Galveston Ball all the way up to a and Consolidated, if you want to consider a and Consolidated part of Houston. And then Alamo Heights in San Antonio and St. Mark's in Dallas. And, and that was the, uh, the width and breadth of the state. And George Block, um, he left Alma Heights, actually, in 1979. And in 1980, he started and opened up the Northside Aquatic Center, which now actually bears his name. Um, and then he's kind of all those teams from the Northside uh, School District, they just, yeah, uh, like Clark High School and, yeah, and Marshall and Holmes, they just kind of just kind of ran rush out in the 80s. To give you an example, the Tom Clark girls played in – nine straight state championship games yes nine yeah. straight um they won four in a row they played john marshall six of those games and that was and that was six in a row the tom Cl and that was on the girl side on the boys side uh clark high school um they won four in a row for the state championships and they went a 101 and one that's a that's a very very strong record I tell you, uh, when George went to Northside and got those teams playing, first of all, it made all of us very much more aware of the history of our Supreme Court. We learned things that we wouldn't have known otherwise. Uh, <laughs> yes, the, exactly. The, the, the most, the fiercest game I ever saw was a girls game, uh, Clark and Marshall in 1981 at uh, Taylor High School in Katy. And in order to get an all deep course, it had to be a little bit more narrow than what it should have been. And when you, when you narrowed that course down, those girls went to war. And it was a, a dream game. I, I'm pretty sure the, the last score ended up four to three. It was low scoring. It was defense. It was intense. And the, uh, the player for Marshall that was named the, the MVP is Valerie Dominguez on your list. That's Valerie Bean, who spent a long time coaching at Cypress Creek. And when she would be, uh, when she would come in with whoever the Cypress Creek team was, I would ask those kids, I'd go, do you realize who the best water polo player I ever saw play was? And they had no idea what I was talking about. And I'd point to Valerie. She never bragged on herself, but she was the best player in the best game that I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of very strong players back then. I look at some of the names. I was a kid back in the in in, in the nineteen eighties. I didn't get into high school till about uh, the yeah, like the late eighties. But I mean, I still remember going and kind of cheering on my older brother and actually playing like us like like my own state championship at at the current Spring Branch Natatorium. Believe that or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, but there was a ton of great water polo. Uh, I mean, you know, kind of John Marshall, like, like the John Marshall girls won in like in 87, a big team was the clear Creek girls that the, yeah, that kind of pulled through and won in 1989. That was the first team from Houston to win in a number of years. So that was a huge kind of step there. San Antonio definitely dominated the eighties. Houston dominated the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, Dallas is now dominating, at least on the uh, on the boys' side, Dallas is dominating the, uh, the 2010s and such. I think the Houston girls are still holding their on. 
But when you look up that, uh, if you're looking at that chart that's got those MVPs, 1986, Brenda Wrighton from out, Wrighton or Wrighton, I'm not even sure how to pronounce her name, but I remember her. Uh, she played for Alamo Heights, and she went on to play for the women's national team. And she also played at UCLA and won a, and, yeah, and won a couple of national championships. Yeah, and had women's water polo been an Olympic sport at that time, Brenda would have been the first Olympian that we had out of the state. Exactly, and I still remember she was a little bit kind of yeah, kind of kind of kind of older than I, but I remember her beating up on me whenever I was a 12, uh, 13 year old in, in the pool. But uh, yeah, and then we can't. Uh, there was the huge uh, game with David Nestor and uh, uh, Mike Maroney back in '86, where Ross Sterling kind of pulled through and won. Right. That was uh, that was Tom's beginning to to dominate this sport in this state. Uh, he he came to he came to Sterling in about 1979, 1980. And he lied to me. He actually told me that he had coached water polo before. And it was years later before he admitted that he had never coached water polo before in his life. But he lied to me about it. We had a very healthy rivalry from the time that he got there between North Shore and Sterling. I left North Shore to go to Enid, Oklahoma, and Tom took off. Tom got a chance to host the Olympic Festival at that Spring Branch pool, mm -hmm. uh, became very involved with the sport. Uh, David Nestor, who had been a freshman for me at North Shore, he moved to Sterling, uh, and they won that first state championship. That was the first of many for Tom, both at Sterling and at Clear Lake. And that was a, and I, and I believe there was a few kids that actually moved from North Shore after they won a couple boys uh, kind of tournaments in the late '80s. That there was moved something over. of a free agency CBA yeah. going on at that time. So hey, uh, but that, that but that just kind of kind of ushered in the kind of like the dominance of the Houston teams in the nineties, I believe in the nineties and into the two thousands uh, or throughout those, all that 20 years, first and second place teams were, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're mostly from both. Yeah. The, yeah. They all came from the, like the Houston kind of area. So um, just tell us, I mean, I think you moved back to Sterling in the early nineties and, and, and I, I think you had a couple 92. strong girls teams there in 92 and 94, right? Yeah. Uh, first team that I had there at Sterling, uh, like to call themselves the pool sharks. <laughs> and they were probably a better team the year before I got there when they played for Tom. Uh, we suffered a couple of injuries at the end of that year. Uh, Side Creek beat them in the state title game there in 1991 and they came back with a vengeance in 92 they might not have been as strong uh one of the players joy gary was our was our best player on that team and she no longer was the offensive threat that she had been because she had a really badly damaged shoulder uh joy is tom's stepdaughter and uh but she led that team the the pool sharks were a uh, a very aggressive group of young ladies and uh Tom had set them up. They were they were primed to win, and we held it together. Uh, Tom asked Joy at one time. He said, "You know, how's this new guy McDonald doing?" Because Tom and I've been friends for a long, long time. And Joy told him, "So, well, I don't know. He's got us wearing skirts and praying before the game. So we'll see how this works out." Hey, but, there's lots but, of different ways, to, yeah, to make it happen, Mac. And and I think you did a great job there. And some other good kind of girls teams there. I think. Uh, what about that St. Agnes Academy team back in 97? St. Agnes, I know that something that's coming up on this podcast is for people to identify what they feel like is the strongest team that they've ever seen in the state of Texas. And my vote would go to the St. Agnes Academy in 1997. They had three girls. Jenny Edwards was the MVP, but every bit as good as Jenny Edwards was Jocelyn Chapman and Aaron Agee. And they were tall. They had tremendous length. They could swim. Uh, Bob Horn was their coach, and Bob had been primarily a boys' water polo coach. But uh, he, he had those girls playing a, a very aggressive game. They, uh, they, they could have humiliated almost anybody that they played. Thank goodness Bob was a gentleman and didn't run the score up. At least he didn't run it up on me. I always knew that they could have beat me by any score that they wanted to name. Uh, but those girls were phenomenal, and they were uh, they were very much great ambassadors of the sport. 
and some other good girls teams at the time were yeah yeah we yeah, were Clear Lake and they won a couple back to back and then kind of Side Creek kind of finished the decade kind of winning a couple back to back but the dominant team in the, in the 90s on the boys side was definitely the Clear Lake boys Tom came back from California and took over the Clear Lake team in 93 um, in 94 he started he uh, started a run where I think they won five in a row, which is the most that any team has ever won in a row. Uh, although Sterling, Sterling has, Sterling's girls came close to being that. They had one interruption. And I'm sure St. Mark's boys could be on a pace to do that as well. But that's, uh, that's who dominated the 90s was Tom's team there at Clear Lake. When a team has a coach that's as good as somebody like Tom Landgraf, I think it sometimes detracts or, or takes away from the, the very best players, but he had some tremendous players there. Nobody coaches well enough to do it without really good players. Um, and, and Tom had Randy Jones and then George DeJohnis, a uh, Greek kid, and Charlie Toth, it looks like three of them there in a row, uh, had a lot of success and – did a great deal with the U.S. Olympic Development Program in order to get the kid, the high school game in Texas to be played the way it was uh, designed to be played nationwide. Yeah, and yeah, there's lots of great water polo. Um, Mac, I appreciate you kind of going down and kind of going over the 70s and the 80s and, and the 90s with us. Um, on our next segment, uh, we're going to go over the like the 2000s and the 2010s and talk about some other things kind of leading up to the UIL. Max, uh, thank you so much for everything that you've done, and then we'll talk to you again. You're very welcome. All right, Joe, we're done. Great conversation with uh, with Mac McDonald. Um, there's so much to unpack about that conversation just because there's it, it's so dense with history. But uh, um, a couple of reminders before we go, right? Yeah, so we're going to do a uh, – podcast kind of number two for this week on thursday it's going to be about the best of texas i'm also going to have part two of my conversation with mac and so we just went over the 70s 80s and 90s and now, and now we're going to go over the like the 2000s and uh, in 2010s um on like uh later this week um there will be some emails that go out about the town hall meetings and the coaches to coaches kind of on zoom and then there's gonna be a ton of stuff going up on tx water polo and also on total water polo that's right. Oh, thank you for the pitch. That's good. Um, yeah, t- both of those are going to be blowing up here as much as possible. Um, again, we uh, announced this morning on uh, on Total Water Polo that there's that new program up in Illinois, Augustana College. They're the f- I-, I have to find out the number because it keeps changing, but the- it's always good to know the total number of programs, and N- NCAA programs in the country. And last I heard, women's was high 60s and men's was over 50 but that could be wrong so i want to go check to see which you know which number program augustana is but go check that out um but yeah keep checking with us uh and uh we're, we'll have plenty of content over the coming weeks so thank you joe all right uh thanks james thanks to you joe thanks to mac mcdonald for taking the time to talk with us and thank you for listening and telling a friend about the tx water polo podcast find us on txwaterpolo.com to listen to us to find us on social media leave comments give to the cause which you've been doing very kindly. Thank you very much. And generally stay up to date on the state of the game. So until next week, so long from Austin. This has been a production of TWP Sports LLC. My dog is scratching at the door. Uh, I can hear him.